Greetings. My name is Ted, and I'd like to welcome you to this electronic way of learning New Testament Greek. This technologically enhanced approach is designed to make your Greek as efficient and enjoyable as possible. I'll be your teaching assistant as you attempt to learn the Greek language. I say teaching assistant because in this type of approach, you're the one who's really the instructor and the learner. And I'll just come alongside you as an assistant. The first thing we need to do to learn the Greek language is, well, get organized. There are basically three formats that'll facilitate our learning of the Greek language. First, there's textbooks. Well, they're not really textbooks, they're more ebooks. We'll be able to print the textbook, which is about 350 pages, a workbook that's about 300 pages. So overall, there's about 800 pages of documents that are freely available as PDF files that you can print on your computer and learn through reading the text, in much the same way as you would in a standard textbook. There will also be ebooks and articles available freely on the DVD, which are paralleled on the website. Again, these PDFs will allow you to print and actually hold the hard copy of uh, the things that are contained on this DVD. The second way is the interactive way. This is where you can kind of mouse around, use the keyboard. The computer will actually talk to you in Greek, and you can talk back in, well, whatever language you like. This interactive part will be broken down into four sections in each chapter. There'll be a learn section, which will basically teach you the content of the chapter. There'll be a drill section, which will drill your skills. Largely, you'll click on buttons and play games of various things. Then there'll be exercises where you actually use the keyboard to type in things. And then finally, a quick review, where there'll be a screen or two that will summarize the whole chapter so that after you've learned it, you can come back and review very quickly. The third approach, besides the textbooks in the interactive part, is the online resources. There are many MP3s that you can download so that you can pump them into your MP3 players and uh, go off and listen to Mastering New Testament Greek amidst the other things you have on your MP3 players. There are also books and articles on Koine Greek that you can access there that will take you far along into your next stage of second year Greek. Because Greek is such a difficult language, I think it is really important to get down exactly why we're studying the Greek language. There'll be points as you study the language and the difficulty level rises that you really wonder, what am I doing in Greek? So it's important then to really have a firm foundation of why exactly I'm learning this language. Perhaps the most important reason for learning Koine Greek is the fact that God has indeed spoken to humankind. And it's kind of like receiving a love letter from a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and you try to sort out and you try to read it as closely as possible and to try to understand every nuance of every word. Did she, she said no, but does she really mean yes? And she said she wants to go, but, but does that mean that she wants to go with someone else or that and, and so there's all sorts of ways that you try to interpret and get all the meaning out of every word. Well, God has written us a love letter, and many of us then desire very intensely to study and to understand what he really said and what he really meant. Learning the Greek language allows us to look very carefully and up close and personal in the language that Jesus originally had recorded for us, Koine Greek. Deuteronomy 6 tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Some have said that we are to love God with head, heart, and hands. Thus, the study of our Greek language will be an expression of our love for God by using our heads. Study, as many have said, is one of the highest forms of worship. 
So as we study the Greek language, it will be an expression of love and worship to the Lord our God. Desiring to hear and obey his word more precisely and with more understanding. Some might ask the initial question, why not just use a good English translation? Let me give you an example from the simple word in Greek, which is the word often translated and. It's the word kai. Kai means and, but it can also mean even, and it can also mean also. And in different contexts, that same word may mean something very different. So, for example, translating into English, ran and jumped, we're coordinating the idea of ran and jumped. But what if we change it like this? The same word would be used in Greek, ran, even jumped. And there you're kind of stressing that he, he was running and then even jumped. Same word chi is used. But then what about the word chi translated also? He ran and also jumped. And there the also has a more additive kind of way of understanding it. And so here you see one simple Greek word, and, can be taken in three very different ways. And so one word in Greek may have uh, five or six or ten different meanings, which then, when it's translated into English, the translator will only pick one of those. And it's very helpful to understand some of the other meanings, which may influence the understanding of the text. Thus, translations are good and helpful, but can't beat reading the Bible in the original languages. Shoo, you got to be careful with all that running and jumping. Some may say just, well, why don't we just learn to use the tools instead of mastering the whole language? Well, let me give you an example in English. The sentence goes like this. He spoke to his daughter, speaking quietly. Who is speaking quietly, he or his daughter? The English is ambiguous. And oftentimes in Greek, there'll be sentences where if you're just using the tools and things, the, the Greek language, the grammar and syntax will be ambiguous, and you need to understand how the language works and how it functions, how a particular writer writes his style, his form, the literary genre that he's using. And so it'll be important to not just be able to use the tools. The tools are very helpful, but to be able to read the language. None of us thinks that in order to understand Shakespeare, we just need to look up every word in the dictionary. Similarly, how can we think that we could understand the New Testament by simply looking up every word in the dictionary? or clicking on a screen that gives us an instantaneous definition is going to get us to understanding the nuances and, and the meaning of the New Testament. Simply put, there's benefit to be able to read closely and to read and decide for yourself. It's important to listen to commentators and other, use other tools, but it's also important to be able to decide for yourself so that you can hear the voice of God more closely. Many in our culture have the idea that, well, oh, the text can mean anything. Your opinion is just as good as someone else's, and someone else's disagrees with you. The meaning of Scripture, then, evaporates into personal preferences. Being able to go back and read the original author in his original language gives you an edge to be able to understand what the original author really meant, not just hearing the echo in your own head. And there's great benefit to being able to read Scripture in a whatever culture. Jesus has said in John 6.63, The very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And therefore, we desire to understand those words, which are spirit and life, carefully and to understand what they originally meant to the original authors, and then deriving from that original intent to what things should mean today for us.
In learning Greek, it'll be really important to keep the goal clearly in mind. And our goal is to learn Koine Greek so that we can better understand, obey, and then communicate the Word of God faithfully and powerfully. And along with the goal, we also need to be very careful about our motivation. I'm always skeptical when I hear somebody say, in the Greek it means, and I keep wondering, why don't you just say it in English? One of our concerns is is that as one learns Greek, they learn it not so that they can kind of get one up on other people, saying, I'm learning Greek so I know, but they don't know. Rather, our goal is to understand the text and then express it to other people that we love and care about, and we want them to understand it better. And we can express those things in English, and so we need to work on our translation skills. So the idea of having humility and uh, using Greek to service other people rather than to lord it over them is our goal and our motivation. Memorization has really been downplayed in our modern educational culture that wants to concentrate on kind of higher order thinking and ignore some of the basic foundational building blocks that have uh, serviced mankind for thousands of years. You will not be able to get around the fact of memorization in Greek. Basically, the vocabulary and forms and various things will have to be learned from memory. So what we want to do is create um, methodologies that will make this uh, level of learning fun. In order to do that, you may want to start right off as you develop your vocabulary, developing a series of flashcards or 3 by 5 cards or however you want to do it to help you coordinate with the vocabulary, which is going to be critical for learning the language. When you do so, you'll notice that we have a series of flashcards available that have images on them or pictures. And the reason is that these pictures provide a mnemonic for helping you to learn the words. And as a, a child, you would hold up an apple and say, apple, and the child would go from that object to the word rather than a word in English going to a word in Greek, it goes from an object to a word. That's the way we learn as a, as a child. And so we've tried to include images or pictures that will trigger the word, and that way you can remember the image and it will trigger the Greek word. And so the images should help you visually to visualize the Greek words. As you read the Greek, please say them out loud. It's very important the audio will be a channel into your brain. And you're teaching your tongue to say the words will also be another way to help you to remember. So saying and repeating out loud will be an important way to reinforce your learning of the Greek vocabulary. And also then just reading uh, Greek out loud will help you to understand it better. Finally, do the exercises seriously. They can turn into sometimes copying exercises, and they're really meant to be done with thought and therefore work on the exercises to gain understanding and to sharpen your skills. Certain structures in Greek are going to be critical for us and in order to master those structures very accurately we will develop a series of chants and so there'll be about 20, 22 chants that we'll learn as we go through this course. And the suggestion is that you just learn these chants, learn to chant them, learn to chant them so deeply you don't even think about it. You just chant them. Then we will be able to use those structures in all sorts of different contexts then. One of the ways, too, we'll be learning the Lord's Prayer. And we'll be doing it to a, kind of a rap structure. And all these things are trying to make Greek fun enjoyable and, most of all, memorable. Time and consistency. Cramming in Greek doesn't really work. Time and consistency over time is the way to really master the language. And therefore, the idea of saving it for a week and then cramming for an exam and things, easy in, easy out, easily forgotten, doesn't work. Better uh, to work consistently, daily, and persistently on learning Greek. And that is a better way to intake it a little bit every day, rather than a, a cramming procedure. Two personal character qualities that will be needed and required to master New Testament Greek will be diligence and persistence. Basically, diligence will be required by working consistently 
on the assignments and, and mastering the materials on a daily basis. And then persistence because of the stamina that it takes to work on learning another language. And uh, persistence is needed. And a lot of times, persistence over time, a person may really struggle with a language, but persistence is the way to finally get it. You learn the English language. The English language, by the way, is much harder than Greek. And so it'll just be a matter of persistence uh, before you get it. You will get it if you just persist. And so persistence and diligence are two character qualities that are really required and will be developed as you master New Testament Greek. One of the great benefits of learning Greek is that many of us have learned much about English grammar by learning about Greek grammar. And as we go through this course, you'll notice that in almost every chapter, we begin with explaining English grammar, which for many of us has somehow eluded us in our educational programs. So in Greek, we will actually uh, learn English grammar structures uh, with adjectives, prepositions, pronouns, how they work with verbs and nouns and various things. We'll actually learn how the structure of the English language works and then apply that to the Greek language. So it's kind of a nice thing. You hit two birds with one stone and that's one of the great benefits of learning Greek is you learn more about how English itself works and how to write and speak more accurately. In thinking about the origins of the Greek language, we need to go back to about 1800 B.C. with the development of the alphabet, uh, largely coming out of Phoenicia and Egypt uh, with just consonants. And some think that as the alphabet was spread by the Phoenicians over to the Greeks, that the Greeks added the vowels, thereby completing the alphabet as we know it. Prior to that, people in Mesopotamia used a syllabic language with about, uh, oh well, over 800 symbols print in cuneiform in uh, Akkadian or Babylonian, and then before that, Sumerian. So it was around 1800 that the uh, alphabet developed, and the development of the alphabet was as critical almost as the uh, printing press, in that now a five- or six-year-old child could be taught to read and write. Whereas prior to that, with the syllabic languages, much more difficult to learn, uh, professional scribes were needed. The Hebrew alphabet, for example, Aleph, means ox. But Alpha in Greek doesn't mean anything. And so what you have is uh, Hebrew, for example, Beit, Aleph, Beit. Beit means house and looks a little bit like a house. But beta in Greek does not mean anything, so it seems that the alphabet itself floated from Semitic origins in the east over to Greece, and then Greece added the vowels. Similarly, Greek was originally written from right to left, as is Hebrew and Aramaic and many of the Semitic languages. It later evolved to a bustrophedon, writing order in which uh, the writer would write from right to left and then at the end of that sentence would come back the other way left to right and so the sentences would go as bustrophedon as an ox plows the field one way and then turn around come back the other way about 500 BC the writing shifted to a left to right ordering of the line probably some have suggested, as a result of a right-handed person would be less likely to smear a document. And so around 500, the writing shifts to a, a left-to-right perspective, which is what we know today, both in Greek and in English. Giving a brief summary of the origins of the, and development of the Greek language, historically, things started uh, prior to about 1000 B.C., or 900 BC, we have the pre-Homeric period, or the Proto-Greek period, where you have Linear A, Linear B, and some of these Proto-Greek languages and, that are found in inscriptional kind of uh, documentation. Hmm, forgot what I was going to say. Well, oh, okay. 
And then around uh, 1000 or 900 BC, we move into the Homeric period with the Iliad and the Odyssey. And the period from about 1000 BC or 900 BC to down to about 330 BC is the period of the dialects. And these dialects uh, vary from Aeolic, which would be some of the early poetic forms, to Doric, which Pindar was written in, Ionic, which Homer and Herodotus and Hippocrates used, and then the most influential later on would be the Attic Greek, which is considered today and many call the classical Greek or the golden era of the Greek language. And Attic Greek then, or classical Greek as we call it today, uh, Sophocles, Euripides, uh, Xenophon, uh, Demosthenes, and then of course Plato wrote in that language. And that period of the dialects, the various regional dialects, goes down to about 333 uh, with Alexander the Great. As Alexander the Great united Greece, the Greeks had to unite their language and that everyone could speak so that his army could work. And as he conquered from Turkey or Asia Minor and down into Egypt, over to Mesopotamian, uh, the Greek language was spread to become the lingua franca of the ancient world from about 333 B.C. and Alexander's 10 years or so of conquering the world. Uh, the language was then spread across the face of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Asia Minor, Turkey, as well as Greece. Uh, this language then became known as Koine from about 330 B.C. to about 330 A.D. And this is the language of the New Testament. It's the Koine, or common language, that was spoken then. This Koine language was not well understood prior to the 20th century when some archaeologists found on some papyrus documents in Egypt rediscovered this language. And so in the 20th century, particularly the earliest part of the 20th century, uh, the Koine language was in one sense rediscovered and redeveloped. And so a lot of our understanding today is much better than at earlier periods when they did not have advantage of a lot of the archaeological finds that have helped us to understand Koine as the common language of the people of that time. Many of those common language documents were lost until found only recently. With the coming of Constantine, about 330 A.D., Byzantine or medieval Greek was born and would have its prominence from about 330 A.D. to about 1453 when the Turks took over the area. As the Roman Empire split east and west, Greek was lost as it became the language of the east while Latin became the language of the west. And so Greek was lost to many of those in the western part of the empire. And this then became known as medieval Greek. In 1453, the Turks invaded Byzantium. And as a result, many scholars from the east fled to the west, thereby giving a revival of the Greek language in the west about 1453 and thereafter. One notices the connection with the Protestant Reformation about 1517 during that time period as the result of the bringing of Greek manuscripts and the revival of the Greek language in the West. Since that time, there has developed two versions of what is called modern Greek, the Katharyousa, or literary language, or book Greek, is an attempt to resurrect some of the Attic features of classical Greek whereas the Demotic language of today is the common language that's just spoken by many in Greece today. Uh, since 1982, the Demotic aspect of the language has taken preeminence, and many of the features, uh, such as uh, the various three types of accents being reduced to one, the breathing marks b being totally eliminated, the date of case itself being eliminated, replaced by uh, prepositions and things like that. So the language has changed quite a bit. Living languages change. And so Greek has changed from the time of the classical and the Koine Greek into modern Greek. But pronunciations are very different, and um, it's very hard to make connections sometimes between modern Greek and Koine Greek. One might think of comparisons between the English language when reading things like Beowulf and you realize that how much the English language has changed.
People that studied classical Greek noted that there was quite a difference between classical Greek and the Greek of the New Testament. And prior to the 20th century, people postulated that uh, the New Testament was written in a Holy Spirit Greek. The Greek was somewhat similar to the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament done in Alexandria in about 200 B.C. and thereafter. The beginning of the 20th century revealed the papyrus of Egypt, which scholars found to be the common Greek that was spoken at that time and found that it was very similar to the New Testament. So what we have is that Jesus spoke the language of the people. And so when we translate it, we should be translating the New Testament into the language of the people. Because of the differences between classical and Koine Greek, one must be careful about reading classical definitions into Koine Greek. An example of this can be found in the word heteros, which means another of a different kind kind of apples and oranges comparison, as opposed to the word alos, which means another of the same kind. Apples, kind of the differences between Macintosh, Red Delicious, Granny Smith, and Cortland apples. All apples, but different varieties. In Koine Greek, heteros can also equal alos. This usage can be seen in verses like 2 Corinthians 11.4 For he that cometh preaches another alone, Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if we receive another heteron, spirit, another gospel, which ye have not accepted. And so here, alos and heteros are basically used interchangeably as synonyms. This is not the case, however, over in Galatians 1.6, where heteros used in a more classical way in contrast to the word alos. And so Paul writes in Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you are soon moved away from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a heteron gospel, another gospel of a different kind. Galatians 1.7, which is not an alo another of the same kind, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And so here Paul is making a contrast between heteros, those preaching a gospel of a different kind, and alos, those preaching another gospel of the same kind. So one must be careful about taking classical meanings and bringing them into Koine Greek. The point being that context rather than etymology, or a word's history, determines meaning. Galatians 4.4 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent his Son. And it's kind of interesting to look at it from a linguistic or language point of view. Prior to 300 B.C., the various regions spoke so many different dialects and languages it would be very difficult to communicate the gospel. But after Alexander went through, the whole ancient world spoke Koine Greek, and therefore the gospel could spread much more easily from one region to another. After Alexander's coming through, the Old Testament was translated into Greek, and therefore others could read the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah prior to Christ's coming. Thus, in the fullness of time, God sent his Son, even includes the Koine language, as part of his development and preparation of the world for his Son. One must be careful not to see Koine Greek as a, a very flat language all the same, but as seeing it as very variegated. Indeed, Dan Wallace, in his book Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, develops the New Testament as representing three different forms of the Koine Greek. For example, he develops the category of the Semitic or Vulgar Greek as found in the books of Revelation, John, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, and Mark. A more conversational Greek is at the level of most of Paul's writings in the book of Matthew. And then what he calls literary Koine is found in Hebrews and Luke Acts, James, the Pastorals, and 1st Peter. And therefore, Koine Greek itself comes in various forms depending on what the writer was trying to do. Shoo! 
It's hard to find a place to stand on this screen. One distinction that one must make in studying Koine Greek it has to do with the manuscripts that have come down to us, largely from 300 A.D. and on. Um, there are two types. One is called the unctuals, and that is when the Greek text is written in all capital letters with no division between the words, and those are called unctual texts. And some of our best and earliest manuscripts are written in the unctual or all capitals with no word division uh, way of writing. Later, uh, medieval period and later, the minuscules came into use, and those are minuscules, little writings that are more uh, with uh, lowercase letters and with uh, more conventions in terms of uh, division between words and others. Those manuscripts are later and usually based on the earlier manuscripts. So there's a distinction between the unctuals, the uppercase letters, and the minuscules in terms of the manuscripts, in terms of early manuscripts and late manuscripts. We should be aware of that and then therefore uh, take care to learn the uppercase or capital letters in Greek because they'll be helpful for reading unctual manuscripts. Finally, before we jump into the alphabet itself, we must make the distinction between inspiration and the copying of Greek manuscripts. Inspiration has to do with God originally speaking through the apostle or prophet and having that message written down for us. And we say that that process is the process of inspiration from God to prophet to text, 100% solid. Now what happened after the writers wrote is that those manuscripts that the original writers wrote, they had to be copied over and over again. And as the scribes copied them, sometimes the scribes would make mistakes. Copying a 100-page, 200-page book by hand is rather difficult to do 100% correctly. And the early Christians especially were avoiding persecution. They were not well trained as scribes as the Hebrews were. And therefore, uh, there were quite a few spelling errors and, and things like that that occur in the various manuscripts. And then as they got copied over and over again through hundreds and even thousands of years, those uh, variants and divergences would uh, be copied over and over again sometimes. And so what happens is that gives birth to um, a study called textual criticism by which those variants, those differences, are collected and put in your New Testament basically in the footnotes and so you can read which manuscripts have which readings and actually no major doctrine is affected by them but it's just good to keep your eye and be aware of the distinction between inspiration which is God to the prophet to the text and the copying process which has scribes involved and many of who struggled with very difficult circumstances, one scribe describing his ink as freezing as he's trying to copy the text. And so under those conditions, uh, we've got to be a little understanding that, that mistakes would be made, and we can correct for those now. We've got over 5,000 Greek manuscripts, and so we can correct and uh, make adjustments for those. And actually, we stand now with probably some of the most accurate copies of the New Testament that the church has ever had. So we stand with confidence in the copies that we have, but we should be aware of the differences in the variants. The variants have nothing to do with inspiration, but have to everything to do with the copying process. All right, let's tackle the alphabet. I'll say each letter of the alphabet and then give the corresponding sound. You'll be able to see the lowercase alphabet letter on the left and the uppercase on the right. So let's begin. Alpha sounds like the A in father. Beta sounds like the B in Bible. Gamma sounds like the G in gone. Delta sounds like the D in dog. Epsilon sounds like the E in met. Zeta sounds like the Z in days when it begins a word, and DZ when it's found in the middle of a word. Eta 
sounds like the E in obey. Theta sounds like the TH in think. The short iota sounds like the I in sit. The long iota sounds like the I in machine. And then in some Semitic names that begin with the iota, they're pronounced with a Y sound as in Jesus. We will generally pronounce it as in modern Greek as a long iota, as the E sound in machine. Kappa sounds like the K in kitchen. Lambda sounds like the L in law. Mu sounds like the M in mother. Nu sounds like the N in nu. C sounds like the X in X. Omicron sounds like the O in omelet. We will pronounce it as the O in obey, as in modern Greek. P sounds like the P in peach. Rho sounds like the R in rod. Sigma sounds like the S in set. Sigma, when it comes at the end of a word, changes forms and looks almost similar to a, an English S. It's called a final sigma. Tau sounds like the T in talk. Upsilon sounds like the double O in hoops. Phi sounds like the PH in phone. Key sounds like the CH in chemical. C sounds like the PS in lips. Omega sounds like the O in tone. All right, now we've got the individual elements. Let's put it all together. This is your first chant through. Follow the rhythms. Learn this as a chant. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, tau, upsilon, phi, ki, psi, omega. There are five letters that are considered double consonants. They are theta, xi, phi, ki, psi. There are five letters in Greek that are easy to confuse with English letters. They are Ada kind of looks like an N. Noon, which looks like a V. Rho, which looks like a P. Key, which looks like an X. Omega, which looks like a W. There are no V or W sounds in Greek. One of the unique features of Greek pronunciation is what's called a nasal gamma. This is when gamma is pronounced like a N sound, when it comes before another gamma, kappa, ki, or xi. So in the word angelos, you have two gammas in a row. The first one is pronounced like an N, so it's angelos, not agalos. It's Angelos. 
and that is what is called a nasal gamma. Vowels in Greek are somewhat similar to English vowels. There are short vowels and long vowels. As in English, we have a e i o u. In Greek, we have alpha, epsilon, eta, iota, omicron, upsilon, and omega. Epsilon and omicron are always short. The corresponding eta and omega are always long. Alpha, iota, upsilon can be either long or short, and often in the alpha and upsilon, it doesn't really affect the pronunciation. It does affect the pronunciation of the iota, with the short iota being a i sound and the long iota being an e sound. In modern Greek, iota is mostly taken as long. So if you wonder which way to go,、uh, usually error on the side of taking it as a long, as the I in machine. This is just a handy chart to help you visualize the the two always short vowels, the two always long vowels, and the vowels that can go either long or short. Diphthongs are found both in Greek and in English, and you really have to keep track of these combinations. They're basically two vowels that make one sound. Alpha iota is pronounced i as in isle. Epsilon iota is pronounced a as in eight. Omicron iota is pronounced oi as in oil. Upsilon iota is pronounced we as in sweet. Alpha upsilon is pronounced ao as in sauerkraut. Epsilon upsilon and eta upsilon are pronounced u. As in feud. Omicron upsilon is pronounced u, as in soup. All of them are considered long, except alpha iota and omicron iota when they're in the final position. One hint: just notice that all the diphthongs end in either an iota or an upsilon. Because these diphthongs occur so frequently. It's wise to master them very well. There are three special diphthongs, sometimes called improper diphthongs, or better, the iota subscript. The iota subscript is found with the alpha, the eta, and the omega. You'll notice the little. Subscript underneath it is a little iota that's dropped down underneath there.、It、doesn't affect the pronunciation, but you've got to keep track of them because sometimes they can be used for helping us identify syntactical forms. The diaresis is a special symbol. It's a double dot mark that's placed over certain vowels.、It、has the effect of being a diphthong buster. Basically, a diphthong is two vowels that create one sound. This diaresis indicates that the two vowels should be kept separate. It's found in many Semitic names and in many Jewish names that come into the New Testament, where the two vowels need to be kept separate rather than combining to form a diphthong. So the diaresis is a diphthong buster. So instead of a sias with the diaresis, it, it is made. Asaias. I'd like to introduce another way of looking at the alphabet, more linguistically, phonetically, and so I'd like to introduce three categories that we'll be able to use later on as we study various tenses and consonantal shifts that take place in the Greek language. The first are the labials. These are letters that are formed by means of the lips. P, beta, phi, or Pubba fa, 
These are letters that are formed by means of the lips. The dentals are formed by means of the tongue and the teeth, and so they're called dentals because they're formed with the teeth. And that is tau, delta, and theta, or tadatha. These are formed by means of the teeth. The last category are the palatals, and they are formed by placing the tongue at the top, the soft part of the palate of your mouth. And these are kappa, gamma, and ki, or kagaka. They're formed by the tongue on the palate of the mouth. All right. Now that we've got the phonetics down, we need to learn a little bit of phonetic addition. Here's how it's going to work. We're going to add a sigma to the various types that we just learned, and we're going to see what kind of uh, letter results. This uh, adding of the sigma will take place in a couple of our tenses. First of all, the labials, pubafa. When you add a sigma, becomes a ps. The palatals, or the kagaka, when adding a sigma, gives you an xc. And lastly, the dentals, when you add a sigma, simply reduce to the sigma. So that's called phonetic addition, and those three shifts we'll need those later on. Not a big deal, but just、uh, keep them in mind as we move through the course. Finally, we're ready for our first vocabulary list. Our first word is angelos, and it means angel or messenger. Wish I could fly like that. Don't worry about the little breathing marks and accent marks over the word. We'll learn that in the next chapter. The second word is amen, and it means truly or verily. We get our English word "amen" from that. Little boy is praying, about to say "amen." The third word is anthropos, and it means man or human. Kind of look like that fellow, don't I? The fourth word is ego, and it means the personal pronoun I. The fellow there is kind of an egotist. The fifth word is theos, and it means God. It's what we get our English word theology from. The sixth word is the word kai. It means and, even, or also. The seventh word is cardia, and it means heart. Isn't that cute? I'm going to have a cardiac arrest. The eighth word is Lego, and it means I say. The ninth word is prophetes, and it means prophet. Finally, the tenth word is Christos. And it means Christ, Messiah, or Anointed One.